I think you will enjoy and find very moving the theatrical presentation that you're about to witness. Um, this is a story through four monologues. Um, it tells a great portion of the life of the Bob through four characters who are instrumental or key in his life. This is a, uh, the text is from an audio play called Midsummer Noon, a narrative of the life of the Bob. It was written by a very talented uh, Baha'i writer um, named Jack Lenz. And so again, what you're going to witness is uh, individuals delivering monologues. There are two actors and they will be um, delivering monologues on behalf of four characters. One character is Fatima. This is the Bob's mother. And she actually became a Baha'i later in her life. The second character is Mula Hussein. You might recall I mentioned a bit about him earlier. He was the first to recognize um, or become a, a follower of the Bob. And he was the first to what are called the Letters of the Living. The Letters of the Living were 18 individuals who, within about five months of this evening when Mula Hussein had this transformative encounter with the Bob, uh, spontaneously, through dreams and visions and their own searching and encounters with the Bob and his writings, um, accepted him as the promised one. And these first 18 were called the Letters of the Living. So Mula Hussein, the perfect so That's in his mother. Mula Hussein will be one. Um, also, we'll have Khadija. This was the Bob's uh, wife, really an unsung a hero, I would say, at least in my thinking, in the story of the life of the Bob, she underwent so much deprivation and suffering, really, had very uh, intermittent, brief periods with her husband, and they lost a child at a very young age, and she led a very hard life and a very devoted life. She became a Baha'i as well. Um, and then uh, one of the, another one of the letters of the living that will be presented in the monologue form is Tahereh. Uh, she was a great poet. Uh, the only one of the letters of the living who actually never met the Bob in person, to my understanding, but accepted him through her understanding of his writings. And, um, and you will hear about her acceptance of the Bob, and she continues to live on as a very renowned poet in, uh, in that part of the world. So again, uh, we have two very talented actors who will deliver monologues on four characters, uh, Fatima, Mula Hussein, uh, Khadija, and um, uh, Tahereh. Two of those are letters of the letter. I think you'll find this very enjoyable and, of course, very helpful. Thank you. 
he went to Boucher with his uncle, where he had worked as a merchant for five years. My brother told me that he won the esteem of all the merchants he met because of his honesty and trustworthiness. During that time, he continued to devote a large amount of time to prayer. When the Bob returned from Boucher, he was 22. I arranged his marriage to our neighbor's daughter, Amijel. These were happy days. They were so perfect for each other. Although I did not understand it, there seemed to be a change in my son's behavior. I mean, he was always extremely courteous and very mild, but a new radiance seemed to surround him. Other people must have recognized that there was something very special about him, too. Very many young religious students would come to visit him in the evenings. Before long, I realized that Khadija was going to have a baby. In due time, she went to baby, but it was a very difficult baby. And I feared at one point that she was going to die. When I hurried to tell my son about the great condition of his wife, he picked up a mirror, which was beside him, and wrote a prayer on it. He instructed me to hold the mirror in front of Khadija. I did this immediately, and the child was soon born. His life was short. He was a boy, and the Bob named him Ahmad. When Ahmad died, I was very angry at my son. I demanded that he tell me why it was that if he possessed such powers that he had not made an attempt to save the life of his own child. He answered very quietly that he was not destined to have any children. It was soon after this that the heart of the storm entered. My son went on pilgrimage, and when he returned, the religious authorities summoned him to the mosque. They told him that he would stop his teaching. After that, he didn't have a few quiet months before my son moved to my brother's house. He told Khadija that it was for our safety that he was leaving us. You know, women were not allowed to be a part of religious affairs in those days, and it was very difficult for us to learn what was the religious talk of the day was. Sometimes we were rumors on my son's brain which he had promised me. But at the time, my person was not able to investigate this claim. It was towards the end of my life, in the Baha'u'llah, the one that the Bab had sent had come to prepare the way for, sent, to, sent two of his followers to teach me about the wonderful station and mission of my son. It was soon after the bomb moved to my brother's house that the DJ and I heard of his arrest. You can imagine the grief and despair that we felt. We worried about him all of the time. But it was not until one year after his death that we had heard about his execution. After all these years, I still can't begin to tell you how this news came. My name is Mullah Hussain. I was the first one to believe in the Bible. I had been a student of two great teachers in Persia, whose mission it had been to prepare as many people as possible for the coming of the promised one. After their deaths, I fasted and prayed for 40 years, for 40 days, to prepare myself to find the promised one. I felt drawn as if by a magnet, first to the city of Boucher and then to the city of Shiraz. As I approached the gate of that city, a youth of radiant countenance wearing a green turban, advanced toward me with a smile of loving welcome. He embraced me with tender affection as though he had been my intimate and lifelong friend. He then invited me to his house where he showed me the greatest hospitality. With no problem, he asked me what signs had my teachers told me to look for in my search for the promised land. I told him, I was looking for someone between the ages of 20 and 30. 
somewhat of medium height, who was a direct descendant of Muhammad, abstained from smoking, was free of bodily harm, and most importantly, was endowed with innate knowledge. There was a silence. And then he spoke these words. Behold, all of these signs are manifest in me. I was stunned. He then considered each of these aforementioned signs separately and conclusively demonstrated that each and all of them were applicable to this person. I provide to you, sir. He whose advent we await is a man of unsurpassed holiness and the cause he is to bring, a cause of tremendous power. My own knowledge is but a drop compared to that with which he has been endowed. All my attainments are not a speck of dust in the face of the immensity of his knowledge. As soon as I said these words, I felt a fear and remorse come over me. I resolved to take a more humble approach. The bar then picked up the pen and chanted as he started writing and revealed all the answers to the questions which I had not been able to resolve. The overpowering effect of the manner in which he wrote was heightened by the gentle intonation of his voice, which come pretty Not once did he interrupt the flow of verses which streamed from his bed. I sat enraptured by the magic of his voice and the sweeping force of his revelation. When he, when he finished writing, it was two hours and eleven minutes after sunset on May 22nd, 1844. I had no need of further proof. Can you imagine my feelings? After this long and arduous search, I had found the promised one. He then addressed me in these words, O thou who art the first to believe in me, verily I say, I am the vow, the gate of God, and thou art the gate of that gate. Eighteen souls must in the beginning spontaneously and of their own accord accept me and recognize the truth of my revelation. <coughs> Unwarned and uninvited, each of these must seek independently to find me. I shall appoint on each of the 18 souls a special mission. <coughs> he asked me to go to Tehran. There I would find a source of great mystery, source of great knowledge. All that he had shared with me that night came true. The 18 souls whom he called the letters of the living discovered him, and he sent us throughout Persia to teach his cause. The opposition, the opposition was unbelievable, but the power of our faith was great. Thousands of people accepted his teachings, and thousands died in the hands of the government and the clergy. At a place called Fort Tabarsi, I, with 330 companions, tried to defend our faith and our lives. The Shah sent 6,000 soldiers against us. We held our ground for nine months. And then, on February 1st, 1849, I gave my life for the last time. Only I could have been there on that day in public. 